it's more how, how quantum mechanics works, you cannot remove all the energy from a system. Even if you take a single particle and somehow manage to cool it to absolute zero in violation of the laws of thermodynamics, it'll still have some small amount of energy. This is called the zero point energy. So professional motion machine makers say, oh hey, what we could do is take the zero point energy, and because you can't go back past that minimum point, there will still be the zero point energy left. In a sense, free energy. Of course, it does not work this way. The problem with zero point energy is you cannot absolutely eliminate that. You absolutely cannot take that energy away from a system without changing the system itself, in which case you are altering the system and essentially building a motor. Now, the other problem, of course, is that this energy is extremely small. For a basic harmonic oscillator, I believe, the energy is, what, less than one-tenth of one trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a joule? Is that right? I, I'm pretty sure it is. The other problem with zero-point energy is that while you get a lot of people lauding the power of it, you never actually get a zero-point energy machine. Seriously. Most of the times, people who um, talk about zero-point energy and how it revolutionizes the world, they show you stuff like this. Basically, pictures of wonders and new age and empowerment. Other times, you get things that obviously make no sense. This converts water to energy by taking advantage of the etheric vortices and zero-point energy of water which, as most scientists will tell you, is absolute gobbledygook. After some rather extensive searching, I managed to find exactly one machine that worked on supposed zero-point energy and gave an explanation of how it worked. The Jovion. This was actually produced in 2008. It worked by taking advantage of something called the Casimir effect. In other words, if you have two plates really, really close together, on the order of microns apart, they will suddenly be strongly attracted to each other and slammed together. Now, you can't actually use this for energy because in order to use it for a second cycle, you would have to pull them apart, which would take energy. They simply said, oh, obviously since they're being pulled apart, there must be an electric field in between them, not true, and we can just use that electric field to create power, also not true. So they're essentially basing their motor off the fact that isn't actually true based on something that can't be used for energy, like most zero-point energy machines. To be honest, it really marks a sad difference between modern day and empty <coughs> perpetual motion machines. Back then you had, you could honestly create something that looked like it would work except just didn't work. Nowadays you kind of have to bridge your science and nowadays perpetual motion systems are much more based on con games and, and um, well con games and people trying to steal money than honest people trying to save the world. Now this is really the extent of perpetual motion machines. They started off being overbalanced wheels continued being overbalanced wheels, and occasionally adding these things like magnetism and water, and are now zero-point energy machines, which in some actual cases are just overbalanced wheels. There is one last thing I'd like to talk about, though. Perpetual motion machines actually have some scientific use. Specifically, there's two really significant uses of perpetual motion machines. The first is a crash test of a scientific theory. If a scientific theory can create a perpetual motion machine, it probably isn't true. The most famous example of this is the anti-gravity sheet. Can you create a sheet of material that will block gravitational pull? The answer is, if you could, you could create yet another gosh darn over balance wheel. I'd use the proper term, but my parents planned on watching this. So you could, you could well, create a sheet here that would block gravity over here, and this place would always be heavier, so it would constantly be falling. Essentially, an overbalanced wheel that worked. This is why we know that you cannot actually create something that will block gravity like this. There may be a more sophisticated way, but this probably isn't it. The other major use of perpetual motion machines is to further understanding how science works. We create perpetual motion machines as thought experiments and try to figure out why they don't work. In a sense, trying to further our knowledge by seeing what the flaws in our reasoning these tend to be very complex machines, and for the most part, tend to be extremely difficult to explain. One I will try to explain is the famous Brownian ratchet, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The logic is fairly simple. You put a, you put a, rot a rotator in a room, and you also put a ratchet in pawl. In other words, the, the um, rotator can only rotate one way, not the other, because then the pawl will stop it. That's that. Gas in the room, the gas in this room, will occasionally exert some, 
due to Brownian motion, will occasionally have very slight differences in pressure on this side as opposed to this side, which will cause it to rotate forward because gas has statistical effects. On the other hand, sometimes the gas will be stronger on this side than this side, but because of the pull, it cannot rotate backwards. So essentially, you could violate the second law of thermodynamics and decrease the entropy of the system using this rotator, the Brownian ratchet. Now, the problem with this is actually fairly complicated. In order for something to be thin enough and light enough for this to work, in which case very slight differences in pressure will, in fact, cause it to rotate, it must also undergo random motion, and in which case will slip backwards. Uh, Richard Feynman in the 1960s actually calculated that if this, if the pole and the rotator are at the exact same temperature, at over a given period of time it will make no net movement. You can make net movement by putting these at different temperatures, in which case you are essentially making a heat pump. So that really summarizes most of the system. Pretty much that's a brief overview of perpetual motion machines. They don't work, they haven't worked in the past, they probably won't work in the present, and for the foreseeable future they won't work. They've managed to steal a massive amount of money from a massive amount of people, scamming the gullible, the desperate, and the ignorant from a large amount of money. Some of them nowadays tend to be, are still noble attempts, i.e. attempting seriously to create them, but nowadays most of them are simply scams. And that really is the gist of it. Any questions? Yes? Do you know if any number of perpetual motion machines ever produced something that was interesting in spite of the fact that it didn't work? Like if it turned out to secretly be a functional engine that you did some engineering with your, or just, did they do anything like that? I'm trying to actually think on that. I'm not familiar with any case in particular, but if you want, I could do some looking for you. Anything else? Okay, anyway, this lecture was sponsored by the Atmos Clock Engineers and Stephen LaRue's dinner plans at 6.30. I mean, seriously, they paid the 12 cents it cost me to scan all this stuff. <laughs> Making this the most expensive tea, le tea lecture to date. Thank you.